Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for appearing before us. General Milley, I'd like to return to the priorities you just laid out for Senator Reid. Uh, if I heard them right, it was uh, more aviation hours than more home station training for regular Army units, and finally, more CTC training time for National Guard. Those would be three of the areas. There's other areas, but those would be three. That's and correct. It, is that if those are the priorities you'd spend if you got the first extra dollar in your budget, or are those limited just to your priorities for more readiness? Those, those are readiness dollars. Okay. Um, you had uh, mentioned earlier about the, the soldiers we're sending to fight today and your priority for readiness, um, which you've said repeatedly during your tenure as the chief. Um, so America's moms and dads whose soldiers are serving in your army at 25 as an E5 or a first lieutenant can be assured that you would never send one of their sons or daughters into combat unready to fight. Is that That's correct? correct. Um, but that has a cost in modernization. Um, so the uh, moms and dads around America whose 15-year-old son and daughter aspire to be in the Army one day have to be more concerned about the qualitative overmatch and capabilities of a future Army. Is that correct? I think that's also correct, Senator. Um, there is a, uh, some discussion within the Congress about mandating a certain uh, end strength of the Army um, at a higher level than 450,000. Uh, I think that would be a good idea. I'd like to see it much higher than that. Uh, could you talk about the consequences, though, if this Congress does, in fact, mandate a certain end strength without increasing uh, your budget numbers? Uh, I think if we were mandated to go to a higher size, more soldiers, more bigger end strength, uh, and we didn't have the dollars, I personally think that would be uh, disastrous for both the nation uh, and the Army in that we would have to, at the end of the day, uh, mortgage more modernization. Uh, of the future would have to take down installations, uh, quality life program. There's all kinds of things that would have to happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, I think we would risk literally having a hollow army. We do not have a hollow army today, uh, but many on this committee remember the days when we did, and when people didn't train and units weren't filled up at appropriate levels of manning strength and there were no spare parts. All of those things would start happening if we increased the size of the force without the appropriate amount of money to maintain its readiness. Because it, a, a Mandatory in strength and a budget to match would mean that they don't have the money to, to train, to be equipped, That's right. to go to CTCs and so forth. Uh, however, you also mentioned the greater risk of modernization. I assume that's because if the Army mandated a certain in strength, uh, because of your bedrock commitment to send our sons and daughters overseas fully equipped, fully trained, fully manned, you would take even more money out of modernization. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the three levels are in strength, readiness, and and modernization accounts. So we would have to take down, if end strength went up, then the first one out the door is modernization, and, and I certainly do not recommend that. So if there were a mandated increase in the size of the Army, uh, for whatever reason, uh, then, then I would strongly urge that that happen with the money appropriate for the pay and compensation, for the readiness, et cetera. Absent that, I think it would be a big mistake. Thank you. I, I why, why I certainly support us much higher in strength than we're on the path to have. I also think it's be deeply inadvisable not to match that with a concomitant budget increase. Um, turning to modernization because of the risk we're facing there, um, you were speaking with Senator Fisher about some of the commercial technology that we've seen. Um, could you talk a little bit about your new acquisition authorities and your desire to use more commercial off-the-shelf technology? You famously said in the Army's handgun program that if you had, I think, was it $34 million, you could go to Cabela's and buy 17,000 handguns for the Army or something like that? You see the same, you see it across other domains as well with yeah. the Global Response Force desire for enhanced right. mobility or DSIGs versus commercial right. uh, technology. I, I think the uh, proposals that are out there now on the acquisition reform are, are absolutely mo moving in the right direction. I welcome that. I embrace it. Uh, I, I do not claim that I know everything there is to know about acquisition by a long shot, uh, but I think empowering the chiefs uh, to really take greater uh, responsibility, and with that, of course, comes accountability, uh, and, and I welcome that as well. Uh, we should get into it, roll our sleeves up, get after it, uh, and, and get the right equipment to the warfighters uh, in a faster amount of time. 
at, at a reasonable cost to the taxpayer. Uh, the, the pistol is just one example, but I'm bumping into these things all over the place in a wide variety of programs. Uh, so uh, there's been an awful lot of sessions going on in the Army over the last, uh, I guess, six, eight weeks now. Um, I'm probably not on a lot of people's Christmas card list, but that's all okay. Uh, our desire is to make sure our soldiers are taken care of. I, I can't imagine that. Maybe they just want to send, bring you home for Thanksgiving. That must be it. Um, well, I imagine you'll continue to bump up against that, unlike some of your counterparts who can't go to Cabela's and buy a next generation fighter or bomber or a ballistic missile submarine. There are, of course, a lot of modernization opportunities in the Army that use commercial technology, and I know you're committed to that. Thank you. My time's expired.